Okay, we're recording. Hello everyone on YouTube or the internet or wherever you are. My name is Daniel. Um, bringing you here today to answer the very um, ambiguous question to people, all people with OCD think the same. Um, I was inspired to create this prompt because there's a popular channel on YouTube called Jubilee and they bring people with similar mindsets or similar circumstances together and um, have them all respond to a set of prompts. They did one for mental health recently and I thought what if we did one um, specifically for OCD just because I know from my experience talking in the OCD community that there's so much specific stigma and uh, dialogue that it would be cool to have one just for OCD. So yeah, we have, including myself, we have five people here today um, from all over North America. Um, I'll start off by introducing myself. As I said, my name is Daniel or Dan. Um, I'm 26. I'm from the Boston, Massachusetts area. I went to college for entertainment management, but I currently work um, as an assistant to stockbrokers at a wealth management firm. Um, so my career choices are kind of all over the place. Um, I am a writer. I have a blog. If any of you want to check it out, it's uh, dailyinfp.tumblr.com. I'll put a link in the YouTube description below. I recently wrote a piece on um, shame and how it relates to music taste. So if that sounds interesting to you, um, feel free to check it out on my blog. Once again, it's dailyinfp.tumblr.com. Um, or if you like anything that I hear today, if, that I say today, feel free to take a look at my opinions on my blog. I'd love to hear what you have to say. And uh, okay, who wants to go next? Uh, I'll go. Uh, I'm uh, Stephen from uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, I'm also a musician, also 26. Um, yeah, that's me. I can go next. Uh, my name is Dylan. I am 23 years old. Uh, I live in the Albany, New York area, so upstate New York. Uh, I went to college for marketing communication. Uh, I currently am unfortunately unemployed. Uh, but my last job was working in the uh, events marketing department uh, for a window refurbishing company. Um, so I have had jobs before. Um, I am also a writer, uh, though I don't really have anything published right now. Uh, and I also co-run a podcast called the Hidden Knowledge Podcast. We have it up on SoundCloud. It's about occult and mysticism. So if that's something you're into, um, that's something I do. And you can look it up on the internet. And that's basically cool. me in a nutshell. Awesome. Um, so my name is Katie. I am a social work graduate student. I've got about one semester left before I finish my master's. Uh, my concentration will be in child and adolescent mental health. Um, I've had OCD since childhood. And as I have gotten older and more comfortable with that identity, um, I've been doing a lot of advocacy work, so you can find me on Instagram at OCD Illustrated, um, and I'm now on the No CD app as a No CD. It's either ambassador or advocate. I always get them mixed up. Oh, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. I'll have to yeah. look on the app. Um. <laughs> uh, well, my name is Angeles. I'm from Mexico, and my English is not that good, so I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't understand me. Uh, I'm also a musician. I'm 17 years old. I haven't finished high school. Uh, I want to study social science and I'm a really strong feminist. <laughs> so that's all about me. <laughs> I really write <laughs> as well. Cool. Well, welcome everyone. And I'm glad to have you all here. Hopefully this is a interesting discussion and um, we can all be respectful and respect everyone else's opinions and hopefully um, some of our messages that are conveyed here today can uh, get across to people across the globe and either have them reach out or you know know that they're not alone and that there are other people out there who think and feel the same way that they do so let's get started i have my list of prompts here 
first question is, or first prompt rather, and just to uh, go over it again, just when you respond, start off saying you agree, disagree, somewhere in the middle, you strongly agree, strongly disagree, and then feel free to elaborate. So the first prompt is, I am offended when individuals such as comedians make jokes about OCD. For me, I would say that this is a matter of personal taste. I completely respect and understand why someone might be offended by a comedian or an actor or somebody saying, oh, I'm so OCD, like I need my towel straightened or something like that. Like I totally get and respect why people would find that offensive. For me personally, I view comedy as a way to break down barriers and to get people talking about uncomfortable topics. So while some of the premise may be ignorant in a scientific or a factual sense, I think that talking about things casually in a comedic setting often encourages authentic and scientific and you know healthy conversation. So I, and just in general, I consider myself someone who doesn't seek to control others. Um, kind of funny that I have a management degree because I, <laughs> I don't seek to control others. I tell them what to do. Um, needless to say, I, I don't think it's my right to tell someone what is or isn't funny. Um, I think that I, purely believe, I guess you could say in the First Amendment, that uh, in free speech, um, I believe everyone should have the right to say what they want to say, whether I agree with it, disagree with it, find it offensive or not. So yeah, I, um, I am not offended, I disagree. Who else next? So I'm neutral, but that's not because most of the time when I hear jokes about OCD, I have a neutral reaction. I'm, I'm saying that I'm neutral because I think it can go very well or it can go very poorly. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is no topic that is off limits for comedy, but there are topics that are sensitive where not all conversations are good conversations. Um, and I think for comedy to start a productive conversation, that takes a lot more nuance. So for example, Maria Bamford does an excellent job talking about OCD in a funny way and yeah. making jokes. And I like to think that on my Instagram, I do use a lot of humor and memes, um, but that's coming from a place of actually understanding what OCD is and the complexities that it brings and how disabling it can be. Um, not from a place of, isn't this a convenient stereotype for me to make a joke? And I think as somebody who is really familiar with OCD, it is not hard for me to distinguish the difference. Um, and I think that it's really important that we teach people not that you can't joke about mental health, but if you're going to do it, just like if you're going to joke about race or you're going to joke about gender, there are ways to do it that, um, that are offensive and demeaning and that I think are not okay, that are disrespectful. And there are ways to do it that are respectful and contribute to a positive conversation instead of perpetuating um, misinformation. So. Yeah, if I may, I actually completely agree with you. And I'm really glad that you brought up Maria Bamford. I was actually going to bring her up as what I thought was also a good example of uh, making jokes about mental illness in like a respectful um, and educated manner. Um, I hang out with a lot of comedians. I know a lot of people who work in that industry. And uh, I have some conversations with them. And one of the things we always agreed on that is key to good comedy is the idea of punching up. Um, so if you're just making fun of and mocking people who don't necessarily have a capacity to defend themselves, that's just mean spirited and that's cruel um, versus uh, when you are maybe analyzing or critiquing uh, a subject matter from like a perspective of understanding. 
And so I think that same thing can, that same philosophy can more or less apply to when someone's joking about OCD. It's like, if you're just making fun of people with OCD, I think you realize, you know, at a certain point, that's just bullying. That's not actually any bit of a stand-up comedy routine. Um, but if you're taking an intellectual approach to it, uh, and you're really breaking down what the illness is and looking at it from a different perspective and trying to shed some light with comedy, um, I totally agree that that's, that's a good thing. And uh, I even agree a lot. I think that goes with what Dan was saying, where it allows conversations to more casually be generated around the topic. Uh, and it allows us to destigmatize. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. And then ultimately, I guess I, I'm fairly neutral because it's like, there are definitely some bad examples out there that make me cringe. Um, but there are good examples out there too that I like. I would say I also agree. Um, I'm pretty neutral. Um, I, I just wish people had a better understanding of it. Um, that's my biggest thing. When people joke about it being just, just being clean um, and organized, um, they just, I wish they understood that it goes far beyond any of that. Um, so that's, but yeah, I, I pretty much agree with you guys on that. Cool. Angelus, what do you think? Uh, well, I agree with the prompt. I really get offended by a lot of jokes about OCD. And obviously not by comedians that actually have OCD, but by those that actually don't understand the illness and the debilitating it is to have this. And um, I think the reason why I agree is because it's it spreads misinformation. Like the people who hear that joke uh, don't know what is OCD and will think that OCD is just like the jokes they make. Um, for example, when I told my friends that I had OCD, they just were like, oh, but you're not clean, you're not tidy. And it's because of that information they receive. So I think that most people that make those jokes doesn't have a bad intention but they are, the consequences are not good. Um, I think uh, OCD, like we have to spread more information about what it really is and to stop those jokes that, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. Cool. I yeah, I think. Oh, sorry, you were going to. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think we can all agree that it's important that correct information is out there um, and that uh, artists, comedians, actors, you know, take the social responsibility to kind of, if they do make an ignorant comment, to kind of inform what the reality is. And because, you know, these people, they have such a uh, regarded platform that is so powerful, it can be very important how their messages come across. And if they're willing to admit that they, you know, really offended someone or really hurt someone or whatever. So, yeah. well, and what yeah. Angela brought up too is about the information and I think the oh I'm so OCD jokes would be less damaging if the public had 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 things other than jokes to go on to get information about OCD. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, when people think about cancer or they think about a lot of other illnesses they have background information so that when they hear the joke, and, and I don't think this would be a good joke, but it's just the first thing that came to my mind. When they hear a joke about, you know, somebody being bald and having cancer, they don't think, oh, every bald person has cancer, right? right. They have a context to put it into of other accurate information or more accurate information. And with OCD right now, despite all the advocacy that we're doing, a lot of people's understanding of OCD is coming from jokes alone. Um, right. And that's a big part of the problem, um, is that the dialogue about OCD is so heavily joke-based um, that, that the accurate information is, is not there to put the jokes in context often for individuals. And, and jumping off of that, I feel like the jokes are really predicated on the idea that OCD is like a personality quirk, um, or it's like just like a very small set of habits or behaviors that it's like, oh, if you're a neat freak, you're OCD. Like people start to treat 
the like yeah being cleanly being like an uptight person as just a synonymous state of being with obsessive compulsive disorder the disease and so i think yeah a lot of those jokes are made without people even understanding like the countless hours of therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy that go into rewiring uh the illness um they just picture it i think the craziest thing to me is when those little jokes are made by people who are like i'm so ocd i only eat red skittles or something like that <laughs> it's people not even thinking about um yeah, just the countless hours of therapy that often has to occur for many people to be able to manage their condition. Not saying that's always what happens, but a fair amount of the time it is. Yeah, I agree with both of you. I think you make both, both make good points. Anyone else have any other uh, points you want to bring up on that? Are we good? We're good? Okay. Our next prompt is ERP is the only valid treatment option when it comes to managing OCD. Now, um, for people watching this who may not know what ERP is, it stands for Exposure and Response Prevention. Um, simplest way to, to simplify it is you willingly choose to expose yourself to a stimuli or something that you're afraid of and not do the response that reduces the anxiety or eliminates anxiety. You make the choice to feel anxiety, to feel fear, and most importantly, to accept the un uncertainty that comes with um, being exposed to your fear. Um, and that was one big thing for me when I did ERP, is that I didn't realize that there was this whole uncertainty element. So I was like, uncertainty, what is that? What does that mean? Um, and I had to really educate myself through the process um, to learn about how OCD works and what uncertainty, how uncertainty plays a role in it, et cetera. With that being said, I would say that I somewhat agree. Um, I say this specifically because from my own experience, I did ERP with a therapist who incorporates elements of ACT. Um, and I found that to be, which I should also say, ACT is a mindfulness-based therapy um, that is also used with OCD, um, and some people respond to that better, the dialogue of ACT, than they do to ERP. So that's where I am on somewhat agree, because I think that the dialogue and um, teachings of ACT were so essential to my recovery um, that I can't flat out say that ERP is the only way to manage OCD treatment. And kind of like I said in the beginning of this video, I don't seek to tell other people what to do. Um, so if someone finds a 12 step program or whatever works for them, like you, it's all you, man. Like it's your life. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Um, for me personally, I find that a combination of medication, ERP, and ACT all help me um, manage my OCD. I would say uh, somewhat agree. Um, I'm someone who just recently started ERP, um, still very new to it. Um, but with anxiety, the biggest thing is facing your fears, whatever it is. Um, but I also think a big part of OCD is just um, thinking about your the worst case scenario of your thought. If you're like, okay, well, if this is the worst case, started thinking about it that way. Um, and just rewiring how you think about things and how you respond to your thoughts is a big thing. Uh, medication is also very important. Um, so it's, it's all, it's, it's just taking the right steps um, and finding what works for you because everyone's a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have to agree again with a lot of what's been said. Um, to get into semantics, I think what the phrasing of the prompt was ERP is the only uh, yeah. like method. So yeah. with that in mind, I got to disagree that it is the only method. Uh, if we're going literally on the semantics, because um, like you said, there's other things out there. And like what has already been said, um, different people respond to different things. And one of the most interesting things to me about being a mentally ill person is learning that a lot of 
treatment is still so, I don't want to say experimental because it's not mad science, but it's a lot of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, especially in terms of medication management. There's this weird idea I find in society where it's like, oh, I might have a mental health difficulty. If I go to a doctor, they will give me a pill and then I will feel better. Well, a lot of the times they don't even want to give you the pill if there's another way around it, because yeah. chances are you might have to be taking that pill for years and years and years. And they'd rather avoid that if they can do that. So they're going to want to do CBT, DBT, ACT, uh, you know, all these other different therapies before they're even going to want to try to give you medication assuming you don't just directly go to a psychiatrist who's bad at their job <laughs> or in my opinion, bad at their job. If you just walk in and say, hi, I'm not feeling so great. And they say, take this pill and go away. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of that out there, unfortunately. There is unfortunately a lot of that out there. Um, but yeah, you know, and it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I just spent some time actually uh, in a psychiatric hospital in inpatient care. I'm not ashamed to admit that. And um, I found actually a lot of the things that were talked about in there really contradictory to uh, my OCD treatments that I had received in the past. Like a, some of their mindfulness training was like, oh, just try not to think about the bad thoughts. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand the persistent bad thoughts is the whole nature of my condition. Mm -hmm. um, but, and yet I was watching other people some of which I even met one or two people at OCD who found that that weird like avoidance kind of mindfulness that they were doing was actually really helpful and far be it from me if you have if you can access the relief that they are training you to get to through their methods then that's great so yeah I, I totally just have to say that everyone's different there's even though it is a science there's no exact right way to treat each individual person and I highly, highly recommend ERP, but if you're finding that a different treat treatment method is what helps you the most, then you know what? Go with that treatment method, keep running with it. How about you, Katie? You're probably the most educated one in this group chat right now. <laughs> So, so one of the reasons, right, I, I wanted to be on this is because I think it's important for people with OCD to understand that most clinicians do not receive training on OCD in their graduate school programs. Um, if they get specialized OCD training, that's happening somewhere else, um, which is, you know, an issue that the OCD community is dealing with and the IOCDF and other organizations are working to train more clinicians because um, we need that. Um, I think people are individuals, right? And so there's a lot of treatments that we can try, right? Medication plays a big role. I'm not gonna go into that because I'm not qualified to talk about medication in an educated way, right? That's a conversation for a doctor to have with you if that's something you're interested in. Um, but there, there is evidence behind these different treatments and there's different amounts of evidence um, and there's patterns between people. So when we're choosing a treatment, it makes sense to bet on the treatment that has worked for the most people and to try that first, right? You wouldn't say like, okay, I have this problem. Let's try something that has worked for 1% of people first when we've got something that's worked for 80% as well. Um, and what the evidence shows is that exposure and response prevention is the gold standard. It's what you should try first. Um, in a head-to-head -head comparison of ERP versus medication, ERP wins. Um, when I look at ERP though, I think of it um, a little more flexibly. So I know ACT has been brought up, um, other things, right? There's medication, there's transcranial magnetic stimulation that is gradually getting um, support and that's all great. So I think of OCD treatment as like making a soup um, and there's lots of good foods that aren't soups um, and there's nothing wrong with those foods but if treating OCD effectively is like making a soup you have to have broth um, and the broth is the ERP, right? If you're doing ACT, if you're using medication, if you're doing transcranial magnetic stimulation, at some point at the end of the day you have to face your fears and not do rituals. Um, and, and that's what ERP is. So it's not about saying ERP is the only thing you can use. It's about saying ERP has to be there in some form. And then you can add all sorts of other things that you need onto it, especially when people have 
comorbidities, you know, if you're treating borderline personality and OCD, or you're treating PTSD and OCD, or an eating disorder and OCD, you're going to be adding other things to the soup. But you need the broth, and the broth is the ERP. Yep, I agree. Angela? Uh, well, <laughs> I think you said it out, but um, I don't know, I'm not really informed on this topic, but for me, ERP and mindfulness has worked really well along medication. Uh, so, yes, I think ERP is necessary, but a lot of people can find other things to complement that. And it is okay, like, I'm not anyone to say that any other thing that ERP is not valid. So, I think it's personal. <laughs> Can I yeah. jump back in for a second? Go ahead. Um, it, it's also really important to understand that there are common therapies out there that therapists are trained to use, well, are trained to use because it's what they cover in their graduate programs that are not just not helpful for OCD, but that actively do harm to people with OCD. And that's not the therapist being malicious. It's them just using the wrong tool for the job. Um, and so, uh, we, we have to be wary of that. I know the IOCDF has a great article. Um, I'm not going to go super into it now, but you, you want to do a little bit of background research um, to see if what you're being offered is, um, is at least neutral, but is hopefully helpful because some of, the, some of the strategies people try, like thought stopping, that's a CBT strategy, right? But it's a CBT strategy that backfires horrendously for OCD. Um, so it's worth doing a little bit of digging. Definitely. I think one thing that's just tragic in this situation is, like Katie said, there are so many people, these therapists, who are otherwise smart and educated, but they're just not trained in ERP or knowledgeable of OCD. Um, um, I was telling Stephen earlier that it took me four therapists before I found one that I felt was one educated in the topic of OCD and two that I actually connected with and we had a good report and we got along well. Um, so yeah, it's a shame that there's still a lot of education to give to the public on this topic, but I hope that um, with topics like these that we can get the word out there more and educate people. So yeah. With that, I'll move us on to our next prompt, which is, um, I have another disorder that is a result of or exists along OCD. Um, I strongly, strongly agree um, on this one. Um, I have a number of other disorders. I have um, general anxiety disorder, I have depression, um, and I also have an eating disorder known as a binge eating disorder. Um, it's hard to say which came first. It's the chicken or the egg question. Um, but my OCD and my binge eating disorder in particular are very linked and the thought process surrounding them um, is very similar. Like I'll give the example of when I first started having obsessions, um, I was very concerned with how my experience surrounding music would be. Um, music is a very important thing in my life, so therefore it was a vulnerable topic to OCD to attack. So I started having um, intrusive thoughts. One of the main ones that landed me in therapy was the phrase sex with. It was this like recurrent earworm that just kept going through my brain in every opportunity that you could think of. And I would be listening to like in this moment or something and my brain would just say sex with Maria Brink over and over again. I'd be like, what is this? Like, why can't I just like sit and listen to this song? Why is my brain interrupting me? Like, it's, does this mean that I don't care about music anymore because um, I'm not paying enough attention to it to it? Like, what does this mean? Um, and my binge eating disorder can have that same kind of urgency to it like my brain can get very hung up on the ritual of what I eat for breakfast or for lunch so let's say before work I usually stop and get a breakfast sandwich um, that kind of becomes a ritual in my mind and if I go to break that ritual 
kind of all hell breaks loose in my mind, similar to how it was with OCD. Oh my God, you're messing up your morning routine. You're not going to be able to get through work. You're going to be too grumpy. You're going to be too sleepy. You're not going to be able to do this. Um, so I think in a way, my OCD and my binge eating disorder kind of complement each other, um, ironically or evilly or however you want to put it. Um, but yeah, I strongly agree that I definitely have another disorder in addition to OCD. I uh, also strongly agree. Um, I've got a few other disorders. Um, I've got ADHD, um, bipolar disorder. Um, I have a tick disorder. Um, and then I have general anxiety as well. Um, and ADHD has always been there. I've always known about that. Um, the OCD uh, started getting bad middle of last year. Um, started getting a bunch of, you know, sexual intrusive thoughts that I didn't want to have. Um, and from there, just went into month or two long obsessions. Um, uh, the thing, the thing about ADHD and OCD together, it can be pretty debilitating. Um, and it's hard to determine which is which sometimes, um, because you have so many thoughts with ADHD. Um, there's what a thing called, um, rapid fire thinking. Um, where you'll get, you know, the normal person will get a thought or two, and then with ADHD, you'll get 10 thoughts for one. Um, so that can be distressing. Um, I also have something called uh, synesthesia, um, which isn't um, as well known as it should be. Um, uh, for me, I have uh, graphene color uh, synesthesia. Um, and the way that overlaps with my OCD, um, I'll get colors, images in my head that I don't like, and I'll have to replace them with another color um, or image. Um, that's been something that's been a little diff difficult for me um, just because uh, it's, I haven't been able to find anyone else who really experiences the same thing. Um, so I'm really hoping that someone sees this who is and knows that they're not alone in anything that you know they think they're alone in um cool yeah i think it's important to highlight um any type of disorder that comes along with ocd because um if you have it someone else probably has that same combination too so yeah yeah uh, speaking of which, um, I have to strongly agree as well. Uh, I also have uh, other illness, well, another illness that's diagnosed alongside my OCD. Um, I have bipolar as well. Um, I'm bipolar one. And um, the funny thing about that is I was diagnosed with OCD first. Uh, I probably officially got an OCD, di OCD diagnosis when I was 21 or 22. Um, and again, I'm 23 now, so I haven't been going around for a long time with that official diagnosis, but I had, you know, I've been in therapy since I was 17 or 18, and for years and years going through different therapists, a lot of doctors were like, you probably have OCD, but uh, much like uh, Catherine was saying, they were like, I'm not really educated enough to diagnose or treat it, so you might have OCD, just look out for that. Um, and then finally getting that diagnosis, it's like, I look back on my life and I was like, oh, all these years I've had OCD. Um, particularly I started having, you know, like sexually intrusive thoughts and things like that when I was probably about 15 or 16 years old. So I look back, I was like, okay, so for this many years I've had OCD and something still felt off, like the way my emotions were and my sleeping schedule and all these other things about me. And eventually doctors were like, you might be bipolar until ultimately when I was 23. So this past year, um, I was diagnosed as bipolar as well. And I had to look back again and go, oh, my entire life, I was bipolar. And that started to explain things for me. So um, to put it more simply, it was like, from the moment I was born on this planet, bipolar, uh, and then roughly around 15 or 16, I began to experience the symptoms of OCD. Um, and so it jumped on board. 
And then in terms of how they relate and connect, I would just say that sometimes um, one of the biggest OCD things I suffer from is what my doctor and I labeled as just not rightism, which I don't know if any of uh, you folks feel this one, but it's like something's wrong. I don't know what it is, and I'm going to ritualize to fix it. Yep, um, I feel that hard, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yep, that's that's one of them. And then so. I feel like sometimes I end up in this situation. I mean, I'm medicated for my bipolar disorder, which has been really, really helpful. Uh, but every now and then I, go, I start to obsess and be like, am I, am I getting a little manic or am I getting a little depressed? And it's almost like this really illogical train of thought I start to get caught up in where I'm like, hmm, can I ritualize myself back to like a homeostasis? Can I compulse enough so that I can control like the chemical imbalance inside of me? Uh, quick answer, no. But uh, there's that part of me that gets really caught up in that and just being like, can I OCD myself into a less bipolar state of mind? when really, again, it's the therapy and it's the medication that's the best course of action to, to deal with that and alleviate it. Yeah. Um, Katie, what do you think? Okay. Um, so I have a couple other disorders. When I was first diagnosed with OCD, I was also diagnosed with social anxiety and depression. Um, I've done a ton of exposure work on my social anxiety and kick that to the curb. That diagnosis is not there anymore. Um, so exposures do work and, and cognitive restructuring and challenging cognitive distortion. So, so that was effective for me. Um, I do still have depression. What I have noticed is that my OCD will rise and rise and rise. And then at some point the depression kicks in. Um, and I make sense of that by realizing that sort of there's a cognitive triad with depression, which is this hopeless, helpless, worthless feeling. So when you have those three feelings, that's sort of the core of depression. And when I'm able to do the things in my life that I care about, I'm not feeling those. Um, but if I'm not able to do the things in my life that I care about and that I value, then yeah, I do feel hopeless, helpless, and worthless. And the main reason that I end up not being able to do the things in my life I care about is because of my OCD. So my OCD will get worse. I'll stop being able to do the things I care about. Then the depression sets in. Um, but with depression comes lack of motivation and you need a lot of motivation to do ERP. Um, so then you're sort of in this tricky situation where it's like, okay, I need to get the depression under control so that I have the energy to do the ERP treatment so that I can get my OCD under control so that I cannot be depressed. And you kind of can just go around and around. Um, the other issues that I deal with, which are both considered highly OCD related. Um, so I do have tics. Uh, I'm not officially diagnosed there. I don't feel at this point that a diagnosis would be helpful. Um, I know I have tics, I know how to deal with them, you know, that's how it is. Um, but also that I engage in body focused repetitive behaviors. Um, so that includes hair pulling from my eyebrows and sometimes from my scalp. Um, and then also skin picking. So you can see I've got a couple spots right now. I'm trying to let them heal up before I have to do a presentation for school. Um, and yeah, so trichotillomania and excoriation disorder or dermatillomania are also considered um, obsessive compulsive related disorders because they are repetitive behaviors that are very hard to stop and are often comorbid with OCD. Um, yeah, it's crazy how this doesn't exist on its own. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, I don't have it like officially diagnosed. Um, even my OCD is like officially diagnosed because like I had this psychiatrist that told me it was probably OCD. But when I wanted to do like the, uh, I don't know, like all the paperwork that the diagnosis requires, uh, it was really expensive. Like my family couldn't afford it. So we went to another place. And this lady that diagnosed me said, like, it was only because of my age and I didn't have anything and it was going to pass, but it didn't. And, uh, well, so I just kept going to this psychiatrist that insisted I have OCD. And she also told me I had, like, depression. And I, um, it's like Katie said, like, 
when my OCD rises and I feel like really helpless and worthless and sad is when like depression goes. So I don't have it all the time. Most of the time I'm okay, but when I can manage my OCD and all the doubts, I I get depressed. But like I I also have medication for that, so it's it's been okay lately. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, in my opinion, I don't know how you, I mean, I know it exists, <laughs> but from where I'm sitting, I don't see how you can't have depression and have OCD. Like, somebody who has OCD and doesn't have depression, <laughs> I wanted to say, like, what are you drinking? Like, let me know what it is. I will drink it. I'll take it. Right. They just tell me. <laughs> um, it's such a torturing illness, especially because it it doesn't go away. Uh, it's chronic. It, it lives with you to some extent for your whole life, um, even when you're well into recovery. Um, so, yeah, it's it's sad, but I'm glad that we're, I'm kind of glad and disappointed. We all seem to agree pretty much on all of these problems so far. I want to see like a disagreement. Hey, don't you dare say that or something. <laughs> like that. I don't know. Um, but before I move on to the next prompt, I want to say, Thank you all for sharing your stories and your feelings and your experiences. Um, I know um, from my own experience that it takes a lot of courage to do that and to be open about things that are still ongoing and are unresolved can be very triggering to people. Um, so thank you all for sharing your experiences. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing yours. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so our next prompt is, I do not want to stop my compulsions or rituals. I would say I somewhat disagree on this one. Um, I Sometimes, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, the anxiety related to an obsession is just so intense that you can consciously admit to yourself, I would rather do the ritual right now than do like the exposure response prevention or whatever. I would rather choose the thing that's going to make me feel better right now, even though I know it's not going to help me in the long term. Um, so while I generally want to um, work on my rituals and my compulsions and remedy them and make them not control me, um, I do recognize that sometimes I just am not at the mental state to eliminate some rituals and um, it often takes time working on a hierarchy of you know addressing things that are less feel less fearful to you and then working your way up to things that are you know more intense um, and in the process there'll be some rituals that you're willing to possibly give up right from the get-go and some that you're not necessarily willing to give up until a lot of practice and a lot of experience. So that's where I stand on that. How about you guys? I would have to agree with, with Daniel on this. Um, when you're caught up in the OCD cycles, it's, um, it's kind of that anxiety is a, it's sort of a numbness until you figure it out or until you finish your compulsion, you're, you just, you don't feel at least, that's how I am. It, I, I can't feel a certain way until I get through it. Um, and that's a very distressing thing, but in the moment you, you're like, okay, I want to, I want to feel again. So I'm going to do this compulsion. And in the, it's very hard. It's, it's kind of like an addiction. Um, and it's, it's kind of like, say you're addicted to cigarettes, you know, I'll just, I'll have one more and, after that, it'd be fine. And, and you just keep going and going. Um, and I'm hoping that through ERP, I can stop, put a stop to compulsions. But right now, it's something I still struggle with. So, you know, one of the things I was kind of thinking over before we started this, um, because we got the questions in advance, was that, you know, my level of insight varies a lot depending on the moment and depending on the particular obsession, right? So insight is, can you see that your behavior is unusual? Can you see that it's unreasonable? Can you see that it's unhelpful? Um, and what I see in myself is that 
I tend to have much better insight for the unreasonableness and unhelpfulness of compulsions that are driven by anxiety. Um, but my insight for compulsions and for obsessions that are that the, the, the upsetting feeling attached is disgust or is guilt um, is much harder for me to shake um, and is much harder for me to, to see as unreasonable and then also to muster the energy to actually change it. Um, and like, like Dan and Steven said, you know, there can be a sort of difference between yeah, long term, I'd like to get rid of this behavior, but in the moment right now, like I really want to do it. Um, so I guess I, I don't know whether I agree or disagree, but those are my thoughts. It takes real strength, no matter what the obsession is, to say, this feels shitty, and I'm going to choose the shittier option now. That takes a real warrior to do, and anyone who does that should kudos to them, because um, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, no, it's like everybody said, you know, uh, OCD is this very interesting illness in the sense that um, you are aware of how alien your thoughts are. Um, there are some mental illnesses out there, which unfortunately, some people have difficulties distinguishing essentially from what is reality and what's not reality. That's not the case with OCD. Like, we know that when we compulse, it's not actually related to what we're doing. It's like, if I stop my foot or if I tap a certain number of times, like, we know, like, scientifically speaking, it has no relation to the outcome that we are fearing. And we're very well aware of it. We know that it only brings us emotional reprieve. And so it's all about that emotional reprieve. And like Steven said, it, it has a, such an addictive uh, relationship with us, that sense of relief that uh, we hunt for in doing these compulsions. And so, yeah, no, I've, I've been in that situation a lot where I'm like, hey, these sets of uh, rituals and compulsions, I want to take care of them and they're easier for me to take care of. And then there's a part of me that goes, oh, but like these ones I don't want to take care of no matter how illogical and irrational they are because they're so soothing to me. Um, and there were times in, in therapy where I stood in my own way. And I think I was actually even dishonest at times with therapists where they're like, how are you doing? I'm like, great, because please don't take away these three things from me. I don't want to lose those three because I still can't even fathom what it would be like to not have them. Um, and that's something I'm always working on. That's something I'm always trying to make progress on for myself. But um, yeah, no, I've definitely been in that mindset where from time to time where I'm like, no, I don't want to change how this one thing is or how these multiple reactions are. I, I like them just to stay as they are as a relief method. And it is unhelpful in the long run. Um, but that's why, you know, you take the battle one day at a time and, um, you know, you, you find the strength again and again to make the right choice and throw yourself into the worst case scenario. I want to recognize for a minute that the fact that we are all here um, and and wanting to talk about our OCD and able to talk about our OCD is partly related to the fact that my guess is that most of the five of us here have pretty good insight at this point. And so when you're saying people with OCD know that their thoughts don't make sense, they know their behaviors are hurting them, that is true of people with OCD with good insight. But not everybody with OCD has good insight. You can diagnose OCD with poor insight or absent insight. Um, and it's especially common for kids and teens to not have insight. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're recognizing that part of our community because not everybody with OCD knows that their thoughts and behaviors don't make sense. Many of us do, and that's part of the pain of it, um, but there are people that don't. Totally, and I appreciate, I appreciate that correction. Thank you very much. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you for bringing that up. You know, and there's people, like I said, insight can change from moment to moment and from obsession to obsession and, and through treatment, right? So a lot of people will start out with kind of moderate insight when they get into treatment. And then as they do more treatment, their insight grows. And at the end of it, they have really good insight. So it's not a uh, like death sentence to not have insight, right? Insight is something you can develop, um, but it's not something that everybody has to start with. I think that it's especially confusing too when you get into the OCD dialogue of, well, are these thoughts the real me or is this my OCD talking to me? And that can make it, at least in my experience, be hard to like reconcile what's going on and effectively respond to your thoughts and feelings because, you know, like 
tied up in that OCD cycle of is this me or is this the disorder? Is this the disorder? You know. Uh, also, I wanted to thank you, thank you, Katie, because I didn't know this concept of insight, and in, I just realized that I have, I don't have insight. So, like, thank you for introducing me to this. <laughs> Oh, of course. Knowledge is power. Um, that's that's my whole thing on Instagram. So I'm always trying to educate where I can because I think it gives us the capacity to change. And it's so funny that I should be the one to not uh, kind of articulate that because what was really funny is when I was 15 or 16 years old, actually not funny at all, completely tragic, I thought I was patient zero for some kind of new mental illness. Like I just called myself like very self-deprecatingly crazy is all that I would do when I was 15 or 16 because the common mythos surrounding OCD was, well, these are people who wash their hands a lot. These are people who are organized. And I fell for those, those cliches because I had all these intrusive thoughts. And I thought, what illness out there actually, you know, is defined by these intrusive thoughts? Little did I know that was OCD. So I was walking around for a very long period of my life thinking I had, I was the only one suffering from this really unique d disorder and scared to talk about it. So, you know, it's so interesting that I should be able to grow my insight so much through therapy that there's times now that I forget that I didn't know that I had OCD. Um, it's, it's really funny to me that I can get to that point um, and somewhat a show of, as you said, the, the skills that you build along the way that become like second nature. It almost becomes like a second for me, like a depression where it's like, because I look back with the insight that I have now and I'm like, oh, if I only knew I could have responded this way or I only knew I could have done this, then like how different would my childhood have been? Like if I knew that I had a disorder and I knew I had etc um and that can be a very triggering thing oh yeah yes <laughs> i also like well i was like you Bilan, like when i was like 15 when this all started i didn't know i have ocd because like the way i saw it in the media or in the way people talk about it i didn't know i had it so i didn't even know a thing about mental illness so i feel like really guilty because I also had like sexual intrusive thoughts and I this is like really hard to say but I even felt like guilty about not killing myself because I thought I could hurt people if I keep like living but unfortunately no <laughs> unfortunately I don't know if that is a word in English but I just um, got help like from a therapist first it doesn't help a lot but then I just I don't know actually where I heard first about OCD but like all these pages and all these people have helped me a lot about knowing I'm, I'm not the only one who has it and I think it's really good that it's getting like more recognition. Yeah definitely I um I hope that one day that, you know, a mental illness is as significant as um, a broken bone. Like, not to say that that's not significant, but not that it's like, well, where am I going to get treatment? You know, I hope for one day when we, we know the answer is you do this or you do that, or these are my options available to me. Sometimes people spend years and years obsessing before they even come across the disorder, like you were kind of just saying, actually. Um, so... Yeah, I hope that one day it's it's pretty common knowledge. And I hope that one day, too, that our lawmakers, I mean, not to get too much into politics, I hope that one day our politicians make it so that mental health days are something that people can take off from work. Um, because I think that there are genuine times where you really just need a day off and like you're too in your head and you need some space and you just cannot deal with work today. And you should be able to, in my opinion, call out from work just because you need a day to sort your brain out. And I think that's perfectly okay. Oh, definitely. There's, there's, I've almost lost jobs because of mental health, you know, cause I've had to call in repetitively. That's a thing that a lot of bosses won't understand because they, they don't know what it's like to be in your head. So right. um, I definitely right. agree with you on that. Yeah. It's sad. Um, but getting to our last point, 
our last prompt is, I can easily tell others that I have OCD. For me, um, it's kind of, I would say I somewhat agree. It's not black and white. I don't necessarily, it's not my personality to go around to be like, hey, I am this person and I love this and this is me. Like I, I'm more the type of person that I would rather observe than dictate. Um, I kind of pick and choose who I show myself to. Um, I realize that this group chat is kind of contradicting that habit, but um, I generally am someone who will hold off before I tell somebody about my life. But a general rule for me is if I feel that I'm in a situation where explaining my mental health struggles is beneficial to the conversation or might be beneficial to the person I'm talking to, I'll look past my kind of reservations and my natural inclination to be quiet and be reserved and to be an observer and instead choose to share my story if I believe it shows greater benefit. Because at the end of the day, I really don't give a shit what people think. Um, I am who I am. And if you don't like it, you don't have to associate with me. Um, I'm not the type of person that like, you know, needs tons of people around me to be satisfied. I can do that myself. So I am not too worried about what you think. Um, but yeah, I somewhat agree. It's for the most part, I'm comfortable with telling people I have OCD. I think, you know, on, on one hand, I, I mean, boundaries are a good thing. It would be an extremely strange social interaction for someone to walk up. Like, I would be very off put if somebody walked up to me and said, like, hi, my name's Bob and I have diabetes. And I would be kind of like, okay, well, <laughs> like, why are you telling me that? Um, you know, mental illness is part of our medical history and we don't share our medical history with everybody and that's a good thing i think then when it comes to okay when do you want to share it when do your values say um or or just necessity when do you have to share it then that's a different question right um so like i'm comfortable talking about ocd right now but um there are some settings where i'm not uh, at work is one of those, you know, and I work in the mental health world. Um, and I want to make sure that people know me as me before I introduce the illness. And when I do introduce the illness, it's usually to say, hey, can I educate you about this? Um, because I think there's some information you're missing that would be really helpful for you. Um, you know, and, and this... I, I'm doing more and more advocacy and that's more and more a part of my healing process. And it is an exposure. The more I talk about OCD, the more I let people know about it, the more, you know, at first it's really uncomfortable and then the more comfortable I become. Um, but I don't want people to think like that, that any kind of your medical history is something that you owe people to know because it's not right. Mm -hmm you know, we have all sorts of privacy protections on medical information and OCD is included under that. Yeah, I'm really glad uh, that you brought up the idea of how healthy boundaries can be because I actually am someone who has to end up saying I strongly agree with I have no problem telling people that I have both OCD and also my bipolar. In fact, I would say it's even almost been a detriment to me sometimes my desire to live so transparently i certainly wasn't like checking out of a like a grocery store and just being like hey just so you know i have ocd <laughs> I, I, I never got to that point luckily but i definitely came very close um and some would even argue and i would even argue that it became an obsession and a compulsion in itself to try to make sure i was living transparently because one of my core values is i love honesty and so i was like oh my god am i really introducing myself am i really meeting people if they don't know this aspect of me so it kind of had this inception second layer of like well the ocd me talking about my ocd was sometimes ocd Mm -hmm. Um, and I had plenty of therapists who were like trying, you know, like being amongst friends or making friends who don't know about it. Like, just know you as you, like people had to like, tell me that. Um, cause I definitely had, a, have not just had, I definitely still struggle with identifying where I begin and where the mental illness begins. I definitely sometimes think of it as such an integral and undividable part of my identity 
um, to a degree that's probably honestly not healthy. And so I'm learning to divorce the two and I'm learning now to rediscover who I am and try to share that with people. And it's like you said, can start considering the mental illness, just that's my medical history. Like, is there a way that I can make it into a story that's gonna be helpful for someone? Well then yeah, share it in that instance. Is there, you know, someone else who's talking about their medical history and some of their struggles with it? And I can relate and we can talk about, you know, these shared, problems then yes but other than that i'm starting to realize that it doesn't actually need to come up all the time um bearing circumstances like this where it's very relevant and very helpful uh for me it it's um somewhat difficult to talk to others about ocd and tell them hey i have this because um they don't understand you know it's it's easy to talk about bipolar or ADHD with someone because I have several friends that have those disorders, but with OCD, it's, I feel like I can only really talk about it with someone else who has OCD. Um, well, and that's if you're not yeah. wanting to have to educate people in the same conversation. Exactly. That's one thing I find is like, if I'm going to talk about OCD, I'm going to have to do a lot of educating people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just don't have the emotional bandwidth to do that. Yeah. Right. It's so uh, like, like right depressing now. when people don't, understand you try and explain it to them i've had plenty of experiences where i've tried to explain it and i try and mentally note like all right let's explain this to someone who has absolutely no knowledge of mental health symptoms and or anxiety and try to explain it to them as simply as i can and when they don't get it it can you almost feel insulted because it's like why are you not are you not listening to what i'm saying but the reality is is that some people they're just it's so foreign to them because it's not applicable to their life. And that can be very frustrating to explain to people. So yeah, I definitely agree that it can be, have an emotional toll having to educate people all the time. I'm sorry, I interrupted, I realized, so, you know. I know, I interrupted. Oh. What you're gonna say is <laughs> oh, you guys are fine, no, you guys are fine. Get all your thoughts in. Yeah, um, all is good. Angela, what do you think? Uh, well, I agree. Uh, I really like to talk about myself in general. And like when I'm in my class or with my friends, uh, I have no problem with bringing OCD or what does it mean to me or what it's like to have OCD. Uh, mostly because I like other people to know if they're feeling weird, if they're feeling something like there's something wrong in them, maybe they have something that needs to be like talked of uh, so they can get like the help they need. So I like to talk about it uh, in a way that people can know there's a lot of people like us. So I like to talk about it. Is it from like in my family? Uh, it's okay. I talk with my mom about it and she gets it. But uh, my dad, uh, he still doesn't think like, I'm I'm not okay. He doesn't believe I have OCD. He doesn't believe I have anything. So I just don't talk to him about this. And my family, like my grandma and they, uh, I don't tell them because I know they will be sad. So I just keep it to myself. And that's sad. I um I my heart goes out to you. I I'm sorry that you're. That's incredibly invalidating to be told that you don't have something or what you have is not a big deal. Because mm -hmm. unless someone's in your shoes, they do not know what it's like. You are the expert of your life. Only you can tell what it's truly like to walk in your shoes. So I hope you know that um, all of us here in this chat, and I'm sure anyone who's watching this, um, you believe that your struggle and situation is valid. And I'm sorry that you have to be surrounded by people who don't necessarily recognize that. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, we got to all of our prompts. Um, anything else that anybody wants to add? Any last minute thoughts that you had about topics after we kind of strayed to different points or whatever? I just want to say I really hope that uh, someone is watching this and they can relate and be like, you know what, I thought I was alone in this and now I'm not. I hope, you know, this helps someone. I agree, like I, one of the biggest, 
one of the most important things for me was hearing people talk about mental illness openly and then that giving me the courage even in my therapy to start to ask more specific questions um because i was the one who really pushed for my diagnosis of ocd um i was like hey i think i have this and then i was the one who went to a specific uh outpatient program in boston when i was living in boston uh for treatment with my ocd and so there is a level of initiative i've noticed uh, for better or for worse, that is required these days for navigating the world of mental health and recovery. Um, and so, yeah, I hope if someone, you know, out there has been struggling with something that sounds like what we've been talking about, um, that they know, hey, I can ask questions and I can, you know, I can be in many ways my own hero and my own champion. And before I ramble on forever, like the second part of that I want to say is that uh, it does get better and then there is a lot of light. Um, there are moments where after some treatment, you feel like you're standing miles and miles above where you started out. Um, it's not hopeless. Um, there are people out there that will work with you. And I know money is an issue. There's a lot of people and organizations that want to work with you cheap um, and, and want to try to be affordable for you. Um, so there are routes and there are options. And I sincerely hope that you find the one that works for you. Yeah, and I think to add on to that, um, I think I said this earlier, it's important to remember that in your search for treatment, it's okay if you don't have success right off the bang. Um, if the therapist isn't properly trained in ERP or whatever therapy you're trying to do for your OCD, that's okay. Um, doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. Um, it just means that it's not a good match um, and you might need to take a different path, but ultimately there is a light at the end of the tunnel, even if you can't see it. Yeah, um, just a little example of that. Um, so I'm not gonna go real deep into to my obsessions or compulsions, but um, one of my compulsions is usually to always wear my hair up. Um, and while I've been at home um, with coronavirus and everything, I've been practicing wearing it down and it's just like a little sign, a little glimmer of hope, right? That I can, I'm sorry, one second. Sorry about that. Um, um, you know, even a few weeks ago, that would have not been possible. Um, so, you know, the light is there, you can reach it. And there is a whole community out there on the web and in person, if you can find it, um, of people that understand and are willing to help. So you're not alone. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for, um, for joining me in this conversation. And um, thank you to everyone who watched. I hope that this was at the very least entertaining for you to watch. Um, if you need someone to talk to, feel free to message me. I'm always willing to talk to people and try and point them in the right direction if I can. Um, and I would love to hear your comments. So feel free to, in the comments below, let me know what you think. Love to hear um, what you have to say. Um, I think a general rule in life is you can't improve unless you're willing to take criticism. So yeah, let us know what you think. And thank you again to everyone for for volunteering and sharing your stories and it's not an easy thing to do so thank you to all four of you i appreciate it thank you thank you for the opportunity applause. Yeah. all right so i think i'm going to end it here thank you guys sounds good bye bye